Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, the host for this weekly live program in which I have a great privilege to introduce to you men and women through whom uh, their faith in Jesus Christ have been brought home to the Catholic Church. The theme for tonight's program is The Path to Rome. And the reason we've chosen that title is because my guest, Dwight Longnecker, has edited a book called The Path to Rome. It includes 16 conversion stories of men and women who came home to the Catholic Church in England. He's visiting here from England. The theme really though is this issue of history again, and we often touch on that in this program because history is very important. You see, we as Christians are historical believers. We are Christians because we believe that there was a man who lived and died and resurrected about 2,000 years ago. And our faith is based on the belief that he is the Son of God. And that he, though he had many followers, chose 12 to whom he said the Holy Spirit would come after his ascension. And we read in the scriptures about those 12 and the church that was started through their ministry, through the power of the Holy Spirit. But there are many Christians throughout the world that know very little after the book of Acts until the day that we live. Many of them know only enough about their faith to trace it back to the founder of their particular tradition, maybe 50 years, 25 years, maybe 100 years. But we are a 2,000-year-old faith, and that it is a chain of witnesses, from Jesus to the apostles to those they chose, and on and on, and we find this vibrant faith all the way through. And Dwight is here with us tonight to talk about his own path to Rome, which actually began here in the States. And here to share that and to talk about how his discovery and hunger for history brought him closer to Jesus Christ and the church. Now, you're an important part of this program every week, so call us with your questions at 1-800-224-9460 or send us an email at journeyhome at EWTN.com. Dwight, welcome to the Journey Home. Good to see you. Nice to be here. It's good to see you again because uh, we met in person about a year ago when That's we were right. at a Path to Rome conference. Mm -hmm. That was a coincidental with your book, wasn't it? That was it was a nice coincidence. It, it fit. That's right. And uh, I knew then I don't want you to have it on your program, but it wasn't always e easy to fly someone here from England. Yeah. But this is a great opportunity to have you here. It's really a trip home, though, right? It is. Yeah. Nice to be back in the States. You have picked up a nice accent, though. You? That's what they say. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Why don't we begin, though, by sharing, as we do every week, your early yeah. journey of the faith. Well, this idea of history is important to me because uh, I was brought up, you know, in, in an evangelical fundamentalist home in Pennsylvania. And some of our earliest memories in our home was the great Christian tradition which we came from. Our ancestors were Mennonites who came from Switzerland mm -hmm. um, in the 18th century. And on my mother's side, they were Swedish Reformed uh, uh, Christians who came. And these two traditions together, for seven or eight generations in my background, we were so proud of this mm -hmm. Christian heritage. And I'm proud of it today, of yes. course, that um, on both sides, everyone who I could think of were not only churchgoers, but claimed to be born-again Christians. And this wonderful historical background and evangelical background, which I came from, was important to us. Um, I wasn't brought up in a Mennonite home, although I lived in Pennsylvania, you know, in Pennsylvania Dutch country, right. uh, with the horses and buggies and all that lovely tradition. Uh, I was brought up in a Bible, independent Bible church. Um, by the time of my parents' generation, their parents had left some of the mainline Protestant denominations, which they felt had, uh, mm. were pursuing a liberal path in Christianity, and they began uh, their own churches. And my parents went to a little church, um, pastored by a very good man, an independent Bible church uh, in the fundamentalist tradition. And so we were brought up within that tradition. Um, my dad was a senior deacon. Uh, we had family devotions at home, you know, on a Sunday, eve uh, every weekday evening, church on Sunday morning, uh, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening prayer meeting, mm -hmm. uh, youth group. And this church, the church was our life, you know, and we memorized Bible verses and uh, a full part of that great evangelical tradition. And then you heard a call to pastor at that point, or it was just to, to college? No, I, I went to high school, and um, after that was sent to Bob Jones University. Uh, Bob Jones is, is well known, I, I guess, as, a, as one of the most um, 
fundamentalism. Well, yeah, the most conservative. fundamentalist, conservative kind That's of right. university. It even made the news not too long ago. I think ago. a few weeks yeah. ago it was right. in, wasn't it, with some of the presidential That's right. problems. That's right. And, you know, our home background and our home faith was very simple and devout. And uh, it was beautiful. My parents' faith was very real and genuine. And I think it's true to say if I have any faith today, Marcus, it's yes. because of the witness and the testimony of my parents. Mm -hmm. But when I went to Bob Jones, uh, I, I sort of had to take part in a religion which was very different. It was still yeah. fundamentalist evangelical religion. Yeah. But there was a north-south divide, you know, Pennsylvania, South Carolina. It was a bit yeah. different. Yeah. Um, there was also the difference that um, at Bob Jones, the religion had a sort of harsh edge to it. Mm. It was very anti-Catholic, uh, violently so, you know, yes. in a very extreme way. A lot of the rules and regulations were very legalistic. I won't go into all the details, but it was not a nice experience. Yes. Huh. But while I was there, uh, a little window of grace opened up. Two windows of grace, I think. One of them was uh, we were permitted to go to a little Episcopal church. And I had been reading English literature, and I was really into C.S. Lewis and uh, reading the poetry of T.S. Eliot and reading English literature and history. I traveled over uh, to Europe a couple of times, and I was really captivated by the whole European and English scene, <laughs> you know. And as part of this, in my sophomore year at Bob Jones, uh, we were permitted to go to a little Anglican church. It was an Episcopalian breakaway. And, uh, you know, there we went and we knelt down and lit candles and had a liturgy and had, you know, Anglican hymns, and it was beautiful. And uh, a little group of us there sort of caught the vision and were introduced to this historic Christianity in a way that we hadn't known before. And, of course, it connected. Uh, I can remember reading C.S. Lewis and saying, this, this guy's a, a good Christian writer. Um, why wasn't he a Southern Baptist, you know? <laughs> and going to this Anglican church, I was connecting with the religion of C.S. Lewis, and, yeah. and of course then all these other great writers in English literature. Yeah. Um, it felt like the real thing, and I thought I wanted to be an Anglican. So I hadn't been baptized up to that point, so I was baptized oh, um, in this little uh, Episcopal breakaway church. And it was there uh, one evening, I'll never forget it, in Evensong, I, the prayer was about um, Lord, help us to serve you uh, in purity of heart and mind. Mm. That I felt the call to the ministry. Mm. And I thought, I want to be ordained in the, in, in the Episcopal Church. Mm. Um, but I'd been to England, and I thought, well, why not go for the real thing? And uh, for me, that meant going to England. Yeah. So uh, I guess I, I did something which I guess only a, a young American could do, um, believing that you can make your dreams come true. <laughs> I thought it'd be nice to be... Uh, an Anglican country parson, you know, to live in the beautiful English countryside and to have a beautiful ancient church, uh, to have a pastoral life ministering to people in, and uh, performing this call to ministry in this way. So I didn't know anybody in England, but I knew the evangelical uh, writer, J.I. Packer. I don't know if oh, you've, yes, you've come across course. him. Yes, yeah. of course. And, Very well um, known amongst evangelicals. That's in America, right. Of course. So I wrote to J.I. Packer. I didn't know J.I. Packer, but I wrote to him through his... Um, publishing house yeah. and said, can you recommend any colleges in, in England? And he said, uh, yeah, two or three. So I wrote to them out of the blue and got accepted at Oxford. <laughs> well, for somebody at who... a small out of the way college. There yeah, Oxford that's University. right. <laughs> <laughs> well, for somebody who loves C.S. Lewis, you know, this was like uh, Mecca. Yeah, right. You know, it was wonderful. And I had the chance to go there for three great years and to study there. Uh, and that led to, to being ordained in, into the Anglican ministry. And all along the way, I was being drawn more and more, uh, as I've hinted, to something deeper, a historical church, mm. um, getting away from the kind of church which had just been created in 1960, which my parents went to, which was very fervent, but it didn't really have deep roots. Um, I was drawn, of course, to Anglicanism and to England, because I felt I wanted to be part of the ancient church in England, to have some roots, to get connected back in um, to something much more ancient and something uh, more real in a way. And that led me, eventually, uh, after I was ordained about uh, five or ten years later, I did end up being a country vicar and having a beautiful big Victorian vicarage house in the English countryside, and I looked after two beautiful old churches, uh, a thousand years old. Wow. Um, uh. You know, dating right back to 
the 11th century. Yeah. Um, the people in the church weren't that old. But, uh, <laughs> but some of the graves were, right? So, yeah, yeah, well, some of the graves were certainly five, six hundred years old. Yeah. And, you know, I had this beautiful ministry in the countryside, and a dream had come true. If you look back at that time um, as a, an Anglican parson, uh, talk about then your understanding of the place of history. You were drawn by this history, but did you have that view that there was like two years between the apostles and Martin Luther? <laughs> yes. I mean, did you have that view which is so common? Yeah, uh, of course, at Bob Jones and, and through that part of my education, um, there was this big gap. We studied the Bible and the Old Testament and the New Testament up to the, through the Acts of the Apostles. And uh, then there was nothing else until the Reformation. And there was this idea that in between there was the Catholic Church, which of course was corrupt and which was decadent and from the beginning was obviously sick. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and the Reformation, it took quite a long time. No, it said this for the Reformation to come along and, and put us back to that early yeah. kind of Christianity. Almost and rediscovery. That's right. The Reformation was seen as this re rediscovery of what it was really like mm -hmm. uh, in the early days. And strangely enough, you know, even when I went to Oxford, I went to an evangelical Anglican uh, seminary. And even there, that idea that uh, church history ended. Um, at the Acts of the Apostles and started again with Luther was kind of an underlying assumption. Of course, it wasn't quite as, as, as um, narrow as, as yeah. the fundamentalist one, but it was still there. Uh, and it wasn't until I became, was an Anglican minister for some years longer that I began to read more of church history and um, some of those gaps started to be filled in. I remember when I studied in seminary that history uh, we filled in those gaps, mm. but it was always understood as if it was independent churches, yeah. independent leaders sending out missionaries mm -hmm. to plant new independent churches. And that we always saw that whenever there was this collusion between bishops with a pope, that that was always uh, a new imposed system that was uh, invented or uh, indoctrinated from Rome. Yeah. from the Roman emperors, and that usually all the guys considered heretics were our heroes. Mm. The Waldensians, all the heretics, were the real yeah. independent folk that were carrying the, you know, the banner for the true yeah. church. There was an idea, wasn't there, that there, was a, there were some, as you say, they were carrying the torch, just a few, that little strand of faithful were carrying the torch yeah. through those years. But your average person in the pew would not have that history at all, yeah. and that's the reality. Mm. Well yeah. then, okay, here you are in your beautiful little parsonage, and out there on the Isle of Wight, that's right? right. Oh, beautiful! You've arrived. Yeah. But what opened your heart to the Catholic Church? Well, by this time I was in my um, mid-thirties. I was married with two young children, and um, my wife and I, Allison and I, considered that you know, in men we had it made in the best yeah. way. Uh, you know, we had a secure future ahead of us. The Isle of Wight was a beautiful place to bring up our family. Mm -hmm. um, and our Christian ministry was, was good and, and mm. worthwhile and, and useful. We had a warm Christian fellowship. The church was growing, mm. um, you know, and I, I guess I had a bit of a reputation as someone who was doing something and getting on and making the church grow. And all the time, though, my understanding of the Catholic faith of my ministry had been grown in a more Catholic direction. I, began, I did see my ministry within the Anglican Church as being part of a, the Catholic Church. I thought that uh, we were Catholic, but we just weren't in union with Rome. Yes. And my Catholic in the understanding of it as the universal true church in that sense? Yes. Or? As an Anglican, we felt that we were a branch of the true church, right. um, even though sadly, like the Orthodox, we were separated from Rome. Yeah. And my spirituality and my prayer life was moving in a very Catholic direction. I went regularly to the Benedictine monastery to make a retreat. and. That really fed uh, my spiritual life an awful lot. Mm. But by the early 90s in the Church of England, um, they were making certain decisions which were going in a particular direction, and they, then I seemed to be on divergent paths, and I thought, can I stay here for the next 30 years? Mm. Um, and I began to examine again the claims of, of the, the Catholic Church. Mm. And I think it all came to a climax when I went to Cor Abbey, which is a Benedictine house on the Isle of Wight. Uh, I used to go on a Sunday afternoon for uh, vespers and solemn benediction, and then nip back to my parish in time to take evening prayer. You know, it was a bit, a bit of a cheat. You know, <laughs> uh, and this core abbey, I should say, is built just a few hundred yards from the ruins of a medieval Cistercian abbey. 
so the history there is very vibrant. And I was there on an October evening, and um, I'll never forget it. I was kneeling down, and the uh, incense was rising, and the monks were singing in the Gregorian chant, and the priest lifted the monstrance uh, as we went into the service of um, benediction. And I cried out to the Lord. I was agonizing over this Catholic thing. And I cried out to the Lord, Lord, I only wanted to serve you in the ancient church in England. And then as the incense was going up, I was thinking, a little voice said inside, but this is the ancient church uh, in England. Hmm. And, you know, the handwriting was on the wall at that point. <laughs> my mind was made up. And um, I discussed it with my wife, and it seemed an impossible thing to do. How yeah. could we? I hadn't trained for any other career. Um, I didn't have any other job prospects. Um, it meant giving up our lovely home, our beautiful churches, our ministry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that handwriting has a sharp edge to it because yeah. that's what it meant. It would mean not just, okay, next Sunday I'm going to start going to a different church, but for you it meant every, everything, including giving up the beauty of that ancient church. Yeah. How, how did you and your wife reconcile that issue? Uh, well, she was very good, you know. She's very practical and down to earth, and she said she could see that I was pretty unhappy. Mm -hmm. um, and we said, can, I mean, we had a beautiful big house, you know. And she said, how can we leave this beautiful house in the country? I said, I, I hate to take you through this. And she said, well, she said, if you're not happy in your job, then you're not happy in your house either. Mm -hmm. um, which is very wise. Yeah. And, and she was always been supportive all the way through. Talk a bit about the, uh, the journey of faith doctrinally, though, from where you were at Bob Jones University through the Anglican Church, and now you're considering the Catholic Church. What about some of those doctrinal struggles? How did you deal with those? That was actually a journey of over 20 years, okay. you know, from Bob Jones days all the way through. But, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm, a, I'm a pretty intuitive person. I, I do think things through, and I, I think I'm somewhat logical, but <laughs> I tend to, spir I'm sp led by spirituality more than doctrine. Mm -hmm. and. Um, for, I think, probably 10 years before the conversion, um, looking back on it, my prayer life was going in a very Catholic direction. I had begun to use the rosary. Um, I was relying on writers like uh, Mother Julian of Norwich and the way of St. Benedict. Yeah. Um, and these ca the Catholic influence and the Catholic spirituality was, was what was mm. really drawing, drawing me home. I did have to, of course, get over certain objections. But it's amazing how some of those objections, too, um, happened first through prayer and spirituality, and secondly, mm -hmm. through logic. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, with the Immaculate Conception uh, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, this is a, a big problem for, for non-Catholics, oh, yes, you know. Right. And um, I can remember I had been praying the Rosary, and I sort of was at a point where I was saying, well, maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to deny it. I'm not going to accept it. I'm just going to leave it. And I was in France and, and uh, visiting, I think it was um, Bayou Cathedral in, in Normandy. And all I can say is that I went into the cathedral, not believing the Immaculate Conception, but I found myself praying in a chapel. And guess it was dedicated to? St. <laughs> <Saint> Bernadette. Uh. <laughs> she, you know, the Blessed Virgin said to her, I am the Immaculate Conception, that's right? right? That's right. Uh, that Lord's. And, I was praying in there, not even particularly praying, praying about the Immaculate Conception, but all I know is that I went out of the cathedral believing it. Yeah. And it was only afterwards did the penny drop that that was St. Bernadette's Chapel. You mm. know, it wasn't a logical thing at the, at the time. <laughs> the beauty of God's providence. Yeah. Um, okay, now as a Catholic, talk a bit about how on your own path to Rome, the, the history of the church came even more alive to you. It maybe mm -hmm. brought you some surprises because I think that's what I found in my own journey. Mm -hmm. I got deep in history, but I was confronted by many things along the way about the truth of history. Yes. As you said when we opened, um, our faith is a historical faith. You know, from Abraham and the patriarchs all the way through, we're talking about real people at a real place and a real time. And that's mm -hmm. exciting for all mm -hmm. Christians because we say, this is an indication that God is working in history in real people's lives. And for me, this is very important because mm. it means God can work in my life. Mm. I think one of the times I really got in touch with the history was uh, 
some years after I'd been an Anglican uh, priest already, I took a hitchhiking pilgrimage to Jerusalem from England. It was a great adventure, okay. um, hitchhiking across France and Italy and Spain, uh, and, and Greece rather, and staying in monasteries all along the way. You were still I, an Anglican at this point. I was still yes, an Anglican, yes. yeah. Uh, and as I walked further and further, um, I was taken one, every time a step further back into history. So that mm -hmm. as I went through France, I went through medieval churches, and as I crossed into Italy, I can remember visiting a place where they said, this church we think was founded by Peter and Paul. You know, then you're in <laughs> touch with their missionary journeys, and then Rome, of course, and on through to Greece and, and the Holy Lands. Mm. The history of it impresses itself yes. upon you. Yes. What about new things you discovered that kind of shattered images that you had had before? Yeah, I, especially in English history. Yes. Because, of course, um, the English Reformation and what happened in 500 years ago uh, in England has really influenced um, America as well. Mm -hmm. Because so much of the uh, English Reformation uh, influence through the Puritans and through the Anglicans and through the Methodists has of course come over to, to America and we've inherited that same understanding of the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of the Reformation, like uh, many Christians, uh, was that uh, in England and, and elsewhere, uh, the, the Catholics were, first of all, before the Reformation, they were dead, they were decadent, they were about to go under anyhow. Yeah. And the Reformation... Ignorant, no Bibles. No uh, Bibles, no the laity were enslaved in superstition and so forth. That's right, that's right. Um, and the Reformation, of course, livened all this up. Um, and after the Reformation, the Catholics were portrayed as uh, spies and undercover agents and... Um, you know, the Jesuits are the kind of bogeymen who are yeah. there sort of yeah. sneaking in and, and trying to undermine things. And, and uh, that's the impression which is given. And beginning to see history, English uh, Catholic history for, as a Catholic, <laughs> was a real eye-opener. <laughs> There's a terrific book out by an English historian called Eamon Duffy. Um, I expect you, you've read it. It's, yeah, it's, it's called Stripping of the Altars. Mm -hmm. And he goes through painstakingly and proves the case that the pre-Reformation church was lively, the laity were well read comparatively, that Bibles and prayer books were being produced in English for people, um, and that a lot of the history we received post-Reformation uh, was pretty biased. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and that the real history in England and the English Reformation, from a Catholic point of view, is one of extreme persecution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the, the terms that, for example, that when I was taught, especially English history, I had never heard of a term called recusant. You run across it once in a while when you read old novels and such. That's right. Well, th there's an example of something that once you read history. Who were the recusants? Uh, the, re the recusants were the... Um, they were the families and the people, the individuals who kept the faith, the Catholic faith, um, right through uh, all of the Reformation persecutions. Mm. Uh, you know, I went to Poland a couple of years ago and um, had a fantastic visit and began talking with the, the people there about the sufferings of the church under the communist regime. Mm. And only then did I, I begin to see the English Catholic history in a new light as well, because um, in a sense, what happened in, co in the communist lands happened in England three or four hundred years before. 400 years before. Mm -hmm. In the communist countries, they took the churches, they closed the seminaries, they closed the monasteries and convents, they tried to teach the state religion, which was atheism. Uh, the church had to go underground. Um, you know, religion wasn't taught in the schools. Mm -hmm. Now, if you compare that to what happened under the Protestant Reformation in England, same thing. Henry VIII um, went in and took the monasteries, took the lands, closed the convents, took the churches, made the clergy marry, um, and anybody who wouldn't submit uh, was likely to be imprisoned or, or, or killed. Thomas and this Moran persecution, and of Fisher. course, yeah. these, all these martyrs, and this persecution went on in England for yeah. three, it didn't really end until the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. Um, it wasn't as severe, of course, for those 300 years, but mm. it still continued. It really, it really is interesting to see that parallel because there are great writers English writers from the 19th century mm -hmm. whose writings had great impact on people's lives who today are completely unknown yeah. folk. Mm -hmm. And that is that they're victims of the same idea that still exists. Yeah. 
I think there's a little remnant of it still in England, and that is the rule that the um, heir to the throne may not marry a Catholic. Yeah. Um, Very it's been pointed out that he, he could probably marry a Hindu or a Jew or a Muslim, <laughs> but you know, not a Catholic. Um, it's, it's a historical anomaly, but it's still there a little bit. I would love to spend an hour talking about mm -hmm. uh, English Reformation history because there's so much. Maybe we'll have some more questions about it because it's very fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you hear the other side of the story yeah. uh, that many of us haven't heard. But what, how do you answer those people that say, well, you know, the history is all well and good, but you know, it doesn't affect my faith. It's not important to me. It's me and Jesus or... Uh, you know, what someone did five, eight, nine hundred years ago doesn't have any effect to me today. Well, of course history has an effect on us because we're the product of history. You know, you're, the, you're the living, vibrant summary of the entire history, for instance, biologically, of your, your whole parents and your ancestors brought you to this point. Yeah. History l literally matters because you're here, yeah. because I'm here. Um, but of course, history has influenced the way we think, it's influenced our culture, it's influenced uh, the way we regard everything in ourselves uh, mm -hmm. and the church especially. Because the church is this um, institution. Someone has said recently, I forget where I read it, that the church is, um, the Catholic Church, and I suppose you'd have to include the Orthodox as well, is the one institution, living institution, which connects us with the ancient world. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, the church is this uh, it's not history like dusty old history books and biographies and museums with artifacts and glass cases. Mm. Uh, the church is living history. It's like a, a stream of living yeah. water coming to us in this great way. And to take part in the, the church, the fullness of the Catholic Church, is to share in the fullness of that history in an unbroken way. You know, in the, the, the Journey Home program every week, we have guests share about their walk and conversion mm. of, with Christ. Now they followed Christ. We look at the history of the church. That's what it is. It's a collection mm -hmm. of thousands of these stories. Yeah. And we call them the lives of the saints. Mm -hmm. And we read the intimate stories of very sometimes common folk mm -hmm. who it's gave their life for Jesus. It's exciting, isn't it? When, when we were evangelicals, we, we, we love to read about um, God's working with Abraham and Moses, these flawed people that he, he rescued and, and redeemed, and, and Gideon and David and Solomon and the prophets, and all the yeah. way through the Bible. Um, Peter and Paul. I mean, flawed and Paul. folk. That yeah, and, and also, to be fair, we, we, there were great heroes of the faith in our Protestant religion yes. from, five, from, from you know, the 1500s onwards, uh, the reformers and the great missionaries and so forth. But as a Catholic, of course, there's 1500 years now that, that I'm learning about and sharing in of all these great saints and heroes of the faith um, in that other section of, of yeah. the church. Yeah, we also see someone like a, a Thomas More, who many even in the secular world, will hold up as a man of great conscience. Yes. But they may miss the point mm -hmm. that his, what his conscience was committed to was mm -hmm. defending the faith in union with the Pope That's right. and dying for that if mm -hmm. necessary mm -hmm. to protect the teachings of the church. We've got a couple moments for a break. Talk a bit about your work now. You work for the St. Barnabas Society in England and what That's is right. that? And Tell us what you uh, When I left the Anglican Church, I was genuinely unemployed for a <laughs> time. <laughs> And As many um, clergy converts. Yeah, and, and had to see what the Lord had next. And after a time of waiting, oh, I spent my time writing and, and, and doing some, some uh, writing work in various ways. And then um, I was asked to join the staff of the St. Barnabas Society. The St. Barnabas Society is like a sister organization to the Coming Home Network. Right. Um, we've been around, around a bit longer. A little longer, longer yeah. that's right. In <laughs> fact, I remember when we, we established the Coming Home Network, we, I was in touch with your founder, or not founder, your president, yes. uh, Keith Jarrett, and we, yeah. he sent me a lot of information and it mm -hmm. helped us start the Coming Home Network. Uh, the St. Barnabas Society was founded as the Converts Aid Society in 1896 uh -huh. by direct request of Pope Leo XIII. He said, Newman and, and some of these Anglicans had come across having a hard time. And um, so the Converts Aid Society was founded to give them help. And in 1992, we changed our name to the St. Barnabas Society because St. Barnabas was that person in the Acts of the Apostles who yes. uh, went and met the newly converted St. Paul mm -hmm. and integrated him into the Apostolic Church with Peter at its head. Yeah. And so we do this wonderful ministry as well, like you do, of helping people to be integrated into the Apostolic Church uh, with the successor of Peter at its head. And it's yeah. a great and exciting work to do. Um, since 1992, as you probably know, we, we've welcomed, helped to welcome uh, more Anglican clergy into the Catholic Church than any time yeah. in history. Yeah. Um, no one's saying the exact numbers, but we reckon yeah. that probably between 800 and 1,000 Anglican clergy 
have come into the Catholic Church since then. Yeah. And an awful lot of them have been ordained as Catholic priests and are serving marvelously mm -hmm. in the Catholic Church. Even a Church. few bishops. Yeah, and a few bishops Bishop too. Bishops, yeah. right. In, this, in the United States, coming home network, a, a, a parallel work in a mm -hmm. sense, but which is, you could, they're different about the states versus England. In the yeah. states, we have this wide breadth of denominations. I think we have clergy converts in the coming home network ranks uh, from over 40 different denominations in America. Yeah, you have more denominations than we That's do. Right. <laughs> so, you're so it's a different work, but the yeah. same work of the Spirit. I think what's happening here might be coming over the, over the pond as well, because we're having more converts from uh, the more evangelical churches now, Church of Scotland, yeah. Methodist Church, Church of the Nazarene, uh, in yeah. England as well, who are coming over. Yeah. Uh, before we take a break, I just want to remind you that um, uh, Dwight's book, The Path to Rome, Modern Journeys to the Catholic Church, and this is again English converts. I do have a chapter in there, but yeah. by your invitation. But uh, if you're interested in this book, the only place in America you can get it right now is through the Coming Home Network. So you'll see information on the screen. If you'd like to uh, uh, get a copy of that book or find out about it, give us a call or write us. But stay with us. We'll be back in just a moment for your questions for Dwight Longnecker on his path to Rome. Welcome back. My guest is Dwight Longnecker. He's here all the way from over the pond, as he says, from England. And um, he's, uh, did you bring any bagpipes with you? <laughs> not this time. To play us a tune here on the show? And I'm not wearing a kilt under this table no. either. Okay, that's right. <laughs> uh, but he's here to talk about his path to Rome. He's been uh, ready to answer your questions. Um, and there were so many things that I think kind of left out when we, <laughs> I mean, the Reformation. Mm -hmm to talk about it. It's such a fascinating subject, so maybe if we get some more questions on that issue, we'll... In fact, the first question is a very simple one. This will go very quickly. Uh, this is from Matthew in Chicago. Dear Marcus and Dwight, could you please explain how church doctrine has developed over the course of history? Very simple one. <laughs> yeah. The, be the best book, of course, on this is uh, Cardinal Newman's famous essay on the development of doctrine. Um, <clears throat> Cardinal Newman writes in rather long, complex sentences, so it's a nice, meaty thing to get your teeth into. But, uh, of course, this is a problem for me coming into the Catholic Church because one of the things I was taught about the Catholic Church is that they invented certain things much later in the day which were completely um, non-scriptural, things like the infallibility of the Pope or the Marian doctrines and so forth. And, of course, um, in understanding the Catholic development of doctrine, we, the Catholic Church teaches firmly that nothing that the Catholic Church teaches is contrary to Scripture. Uh, instead, on the other hand, there are certain things and certain truths from Scripture which uh, will be given over time. Uh, remember when Jesus said to his disciples that he's sending the Holy Spirit uh, and the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. Uh, and he said later that you're not ready for all things right now. And so the implication is that things will be unfolded in time. And sure enough, um, in the early centuries of the church, uh, uh, doctrines like the Incarnation and the Trinity were developed and understood by the church, sometimes through great controversy. Um, but eventually the church came together and decided the truth and decided the right interpretation of the truth, and that doctrine developed. Other doctrines developed later. And the understanding is that the doctrines are developed when they need to be developed because the church uh, is facing some sort of heresy or some sort of problem, and then it comes and defines those things. I also like to think of it like um, uh, the acorn and the oak. Uh, you look at an acorn, it doesn't look anything like an oak tree, but of course the oak tree comes from the acorn. And the development of doctrine is a bit like that, so that as the um, acorn is planted and grows into an oak tree, so that seed doctrine, that kernel of doctrine is there, and sometimes it takes centuries for the church to come to a full understanding of that, of that doctrine. I know that acorn and oak is a great analogy because sadly, the beginning of almost every new Protestant tradition mm -hmm. involves a, a desire to return to the early church. Yeah. You know, and in some sense, there's a great validity to that, to make sure we cleanse away anything that's been added on that shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. But it's also a little bit like 
always throwing away the oak tree and going back to the acorn. It's, it's, it's rejecting the, that development yeah. of the spirit mm -hmm. that has matured the faith yeah. through 2,000 years of martyrdom and sacrifice. This ties in with the history point too, doesn't it? Because uh, with, when history is important, we can see that doctrine has developed. Uh, and some people want to say that, it that they're happy with the developments up to a certain point, like mm -hmm. maybe uh, to the development of the Incarnation doctrines and the Trinity doctrines. Um, but they don't want some other developments yeah. like the papacy and the Marian doctrines, which were developed very, maybe just a small time, a short time after that. Well, actually, in or the, even same at the same council, time. yes, the same council, yeah. the Nicene Creed, there's yes. Marian dogma there. That's right. very important stuff. The council, the council of Chalcedon, where, um, which finally determined the, the uh, incarnational doctrine, but also asserted uh, the primacy of, of the, the, the Pope. Yes, you know, that's so. right. Let's take our first phone call. It's Robert from New Mexico. Hello, Robert. What's your question for us tonight? Actually, I have a real quick question. I am a um, convert to the Catholic Church. Welcome home, Robert. I was a Lutheran. Mm -hmm. Oh, about 20 years ago, probably. All right. And my journey has taken me to the point where I'm working with uh, CCD and I'm working with eighth graders. Great. They consistently ask me about reconciliation and why they need to go to a priest to uh -huh. um, confess. A real easy group to work with, yeah. <laughs> but I'm having a, a yeah sarcastically speaking, right? <laughs> but I'm definitely, I'd like to focus on some areas in the Bible that actually talk about reconciliation. Yes. The, the, the sacrament of reconciliation. All right. Uh, we want to go with that one, because that was one of those that's a little more difficult in Scripture per se, but there are lots of examples of that yes. time of reconciliation. Um, I think one of the things that helped me was um, the passage in, in the book of James where it says, confess your sins to one yes. another. Uh, and just before that it says, uh, yeah. call the elders of the church. Yeah. and confess your sins okay. to one another. And of course, John 20, where Jesus gives them the, the power to forgive sins you sins. forgive. Yeah. And, and 1 John chapter 1, if, if mm -hmm. you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us your sins and yeah. cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's lots of calling us to repent. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I, I love that passage in uh, Acts chapter 2 where all the guys are saved, you know, after the first sermon of mm -hmm. Peter. And they say, what should we do? What should we do? And, and the old evangelical idea would be that they would say, well, accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. right? But he doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. He says, repent and be baptized. One of the things, too, as a former evangelical for me, which I found rather moving, was, you know, in, in my experience being brought up, we had these evangelistic services with an altar call where we were expected to come forward and repent of our sins and, and ask Jesus to save us. And that was a beautiful thing. But in the Catholic Church, um, I'm able to go into the confessional and do that, uh, you know, on a regular basis, to have that intimate meeting with the Lord. And um, yeah. I would encourage Catholics to, to, to go back to confession because I, I think a lot of them are, were taught that it's a gloomy, shameful sort of thing in a dark cupboard. For me, it's, an, it's a sacrament of light and peace. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. All right. Um, I think we had an email looming for us here. Uh, actually, we have a whole bunch of good ones floating there. Okay. Let's take this one from David in Pennsylvania. As a recent convert, I have been telling my Protestant friends of my conversion, it is hard to do because invariably the first question they ask is why? What do you say to people when they ask the why question, why you converted? I had the experience that a friend was upset with me because he thought I was saying I was somehow better than him because I turned Catholic. Well, I have the same experience. I, you know, um, <laughs> I talked to some friends with email. I've been having a three-year con conversation with an old Bob Jones buddy of mine about um, the faith and about the Catholic faith. And I, I try to impress over and over again that Catholics are not saying that our uh, Christian brothers and sisters, our separated brothers and sisters, have um, a faith experience which is worthless uh, or a faith experience which is no good. Um, I like to use the analogy that uh, that faith that I had as uh, an evangelical was like having maybe a, a beautiful little Rembrandt painting. It was good and it was precious and it was wonderful, um, but that as a Catholic I've suddenly stepped into this art gallery, <laughs> which uh, is, there's so much more there. And if anyone says, well, why convert? What's the point? Um, I would simply say, well, why have just a little when you can have a lot? C.S. Lewis talked about mere Christianity. I, I'd like to encourage them to have more Christianity. <laughs> All right, let's take our next caller. This is Greg from Virginia. Hello, Greg, what's your question for us? I appreciate the, uh, you taking the call. Sure. And I've listened, enjoyed listening to the program. Um, I really appreciate you taking the call, especially since I'm not Roman Catholic. Oh, I'm Greek fine, Orthodox. Greg. And my curiosity with uh, the person's being interviewed, uh, as he ex journeyed uh, back into the ancient church 
as you know, the Greek Orthodox Church has ancient roots uh, back right. to Jerusalem. You mentioned you had traveled to Jerusalem in Greece. And I guess I've seen in our own parish many converts come into the, uh, the church who came from Protestant backgrounds. And um, just how, as you journeyed, um, how you um, managed the two, because yeah. the, uh, the two churches have apostolic roots. Yeah. Um, as a Protestant, you know, um, how, how you reconcile the two thank and you. how you chose the, the Church of Rome. Greg, I thank, appreciate thank you for your question, Greg. Uh, in fact, it's a great question, and that is the issue. Why not the Orthodox Church? Because there you are in, in ancient Greece. Um, well, for me, Marcus, I, I never seriously considered the Orthodox, mostly um, because of the cultural question. It seemed to me uh, that I was a Western Christian um, and that Rome was the Western Christian uh, apostolic church. Mm -hmm. And uh, my connections with Rome were all going to be, from going to Anglicanism to Rome, was all gonna, already going to be a big cultural step. Um, and a lot of it was really the practicalities. Yeah. Of course, once I studied a bit more, <clears throat> I think there are important decisions and, and questions between uh, the Catholic and the Orthodox which still need to be solved. Mm -hmm. I'm impressed with the claims of Rome and I'm impressed with the historic claims of Rome and how the ancient Orthodox churches actually, before the break, always recognized the primacy of Rome um, among the ancient patriarchal sees. Yeah. Um, I know a, lo a lot of Orthodox don't like to hear that, but that is a historical fact right. uh, and that's very important to me, to be in touch with that antiquity and to respect the antiquity of the Orthodox as our mm -hmm. sister church, um, but to say that with Rome there is a primacy there which is, is very, very ancient. And once again, I would encourage those who are interested in this issue to look at the very recent document released by Rome. Just a couple of weeks ago. Just a couple of weeks ago yeah. called Dominus Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful document, deals with this issue, this connection, and I'll just add that in my own journey, two issues solidified it for me and why I'm Catholic mm -hmm. and not Orthodox had to do with the place of Peter yeah. and the place of unity. And by, again, struggled with this issue of Peter early in the church, but there are plenty of <coughs> documentations, a couple of wonderful books, a book called Jesus, Peter and the Keys, uh, another book recently released by Stephen Ray on the issue of Peter yeah, upon, upon this rock. rock. Yeah. Excellent books. Anyone who has this question, look at those books and you'll mm -hmm. see the evidence for the authority of Peter from the very beginning. And the other issue of unity was so important to me. Not recent, long ago, I received a, a letter from an, an Orthodox mm. uh, pastor who watches the show all the time, and I appreciated his kind letter, but he asked again about the church. Mm. And I was thinking about it, and I turned to the local phone book mm. under Orthodox, and it reminded me why I'm Catholic. Yeah, you know, I, I've said this to an Orthodox friend as well. Um, with all the greatest respect for the, for the yes. Orthodox, and they have some wonderful traditions and oh, wonderful. Uh, that we need, to, I, we need to grow from the spirituality and the understanding of the Holy Spirit. But I did say to a friend, where do you turn for the final answer? You know, is it the Russian or the Russians in exile or the Greeks or the Greeks in exile or the Antiochians or the Antiochians? Or, um, yeah. Without wanting to throw stones at all, Right. There was still that question of where do you go for the final answer? And, and if there's an, such an importance of an ecumenical council, yeah. how will another one ever be called? Because yeah. there can never be this agreement that's necessary. And there's the shattering of that unity, yeah. which is found in union with mm -hmm. the magisterium around the seat of Peter. Yeah. Let's take this next email, because it still collects, connects with some of the questions okay. we've had. Tom Borromeo with the De Defensoris Fide Foundation. Uh, thank you, Tom, for your email. Dear Journey Home, can you... Could you explain to me why Protestants who journey towards Catholicism do not say ill things about their previous religious denomination, whereas the general attitude of Catholics who find their spiritual paths leading to Protestantism is virulent and venomous? <laughs> well, some, uh, some of my friends say, when I, I'm always very positive about my evangelical upbringing and the Anglican upbringing, and some of my friends think I'm doing a a kind of PR job, you know. <laughs> they think I'm putting a spin on this when in fact I hate where I've come from. And I don't. I mean, yes. you know, I accepted Jesus as my Savior at the age of five with my mother after church one night. And that experience for me is a precious experience which I, I shall never deny. Um, 
I learned the Bible and had this wonderful foundation from the fundamentalists. In Anglicanism, I, I, I shared in one of the most beautiful historic churches that uh, in Christendom, and I love and in a way miss all of that. Um, and yeah. I, I see that as a, a great Christian heritage that I've been lucky to share in. And um, we never want to get, get yeah. down on, on, on any of those uh, you know, people could, of that persuasion. Maybe if I could answer the other half of that question too, because yeah. you and I both experienced this in our work, is I actually have in my library a book of the, the conversion stories of a hundred priests that became Protestant and a book of right. 20 nuns that became Protestant. And But at, at first you'd think, wow, you know, those books ought to uh, be confrontive to our journeys. Mm -hmm. But when you read the stories, you find out something very interesting. And that is that for some reason, many of these who were lifelong Catholics came up through the seminaries, went through the mm -hmm. system, are like so many others who were brought up through Lutheranism or Presbyterianism or mm -hmm. Methodism in the high church, and they didn't have a, a real conversion of heart to Christ. And I was brought up Lutheran. I knew many Lutherans. Mm -hmm. Same struggle, ended up going to some other church. Mm -hmm. And then they'd find Jesus in a very powerful way somewhere mm -hmm. else. And the anger would be that they had never heard it where they had come from. They thought they'd never heard it. They thought they'd never heard yeah. it. I felt the same way. I was brought up Lutheran. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a powerful conversion experience until I was in my adult as a Congregationalist. And I was angry one time at that Lutheran pastor. Why didn't you ever tell me about Jesus? Well, that was absurd. I went back and looked at my confirmation papers when I was 13 years old. And the, the teachings of the Lutheran Church about salvation were very clear. I just didn't hear. Also, I mean, you see, exactly. I, I met Jesus in the fundamentalist church, in my yeah. loving Christian home. Uh, and so I have all that to be grateful for. And in fact, if I received an anti-Catholic education at Bob Jones and to a certain extent in our fundamentalist church, I can't even blame them for that because they were only passing on what they'd learned That's from right. other people. Uh, it was their form of tradition to be anti-Catholic. And mm -hmm. of course, a lot of the things they believed about the Catholic church weren't true to the Catholic faith. They, they believed misunderstandings of the Catholic right. faith. So they can't be blamed for that. Let's take our next caller. This is Joyce from Pennsylvania. What's your question for us tonight? Uh, thank you, Marcus. I, I just wondered if, if you could ask uh, your, um, uh, your guest there if, he, if in his opinion, if he knew the reason or believed the reason or reasons for the influx of, and it's wonderful of uh, Anglican religious leaders into yeah, so. the Catholic Church within the past 20 years, yeah, along so. with uh, several of their uh, parishioners or parishes, I yeah. believe. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Joyce. You just asked him. What, what's the, what is your, the reason that you would see? Yes, the Anglican Church, um, sadly, has been drifting very much from the roots of, of mere Christianity and the roots of the basis of, basics of Christianity. And there have been quite a number of particular issues along the way um, which have made people think about the roots of the church and the roots of Christianity. In 1992, for instance, in the Church of England, they voted to ordain women as priests. And for those of us who believed that the Anglican Church shared in Catholic orders, um, suddenly uh, the Anglican Church was saying, no, we don't. Uh, not a lot of people may not know that the Anglican General Synod who made this vote actually received a letter from uh, the Pope and from the Orthodox Patriarch virtually pleading with them not to take this decision which would so endanger Christian unity. They did anyway. And so an awful lot of us who wanted the Anglican Church to be part of the Catholic Church simply said, it doesn't work anymore. Uh, we have to go to the Catholic Church because the Anglican Church has basically said, um, no, thank you. Uh, we can decide these important issues on our own, in our own backyard for ourselves, the way most Protestant churches do. Uh, and so this is, I think, one of the key reasons, but there are many other things uh, which in themselves aren't so important, perhaps, but they uh, focus our attention and they uh, make us reconsider some very important questions. If you would, given that, that, uh, that question, talk a little bit about the state of the Catholic Church in England today. I mean, many of us here on this side of the pond don't have a good feel for what is the Catholic Church. You may still envision it like we see in the old movies during Elizabethan times. What is the state of, of the church today? Well, the Catholic Church in England has a, has a wonderful and an interesting history. Um, it was really only about just over a hundred years ago that Catholics were given freedom to build churches mm -hmm. and to restore the hierarchy. Up until that time, it was still illegal to, to you know, have a, to build, have a Catholic, new to build new churches, yeah. Catholic churches. 
Um, and during this time as well, without getting into too many details, there was a big uh, immigration uh, into England from Ireland and from Italy. Uh, and so the Catholic churches were built in many ways to minister to all those immigrants. Mm. So in England, the Catholic Church traditionally has three strands. Uh, the ancient recusant families you mentioned, these are the families who, and the people who kept the faith through the, the, what we call the penal years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the immigrants, who now three or four or five generations on are English, but they have Italian and Irish names. Um, and then people like us who are the converts, you mm -hmm. know, the, the new ones. Mm -hmm. And um, these three st strands exist in England. But a lot of people don't know that in England, statistically, the largest number of Christians in any particular denomination are the Catholics. On any given Sunday, there are more Catholics in church uh, yeah. than Anglicans even, even though the Church of England is the big established church with all the ancient buildings and the cathedrals and, and so forth. Yeah, which is a very yeah. sad statistic from yeah. that standpoint. Yes. I mean, it's great that there's Catholics actively involved. Mm -hmm. It would still be great to see a higher percentage even of Catholics themselves yes. practicing their faith. But it's sad to, to think what has mm -hmm. happened to the Anglican church. Mm -hmm. Over the last oh yes, and, and we mustn't be too toot the horn about the Catholics too much because our mass numbers are dropping in England, yeah. and our vocations are dropping as they are in many places in the Western world. So we need to pray for one another. So we mustn't pretend that the English Catholic Church is uh, necessarily going great guns. Let's take this last email really quickly because we're running out of time. This is from Nanette, dear Marcus and Dwight. I am a re revert to the Catholic Church and would like to know if either of you would have any advice on how to respread the truth of the Catholic Church as the one true church? Well, you know, the only thing I can say is that a person who's very dear to me uh, is called June. And June's 96 years old. And I first met her when I used to go and do uh, gardening work for her as a student at Bob Jones. She was a Catholic. Her, her daughter is a very faithful, um, poor Claire nun. June never once spoke to me about religion. But she was my friend. She kept in touch with me. She wrote to me. Uh, she was always giving me a warm welcome when I returned to visit. And now for over 20 years, our friendship has continued. And she was shocked and amazed when I dedicated uh, my book, Path to Rome. It says, For June, inside there. <laughs> because it was her witness, um, her radiant example, which really, uh, and her prayers, which really, I believe, was very instrumental in bringing me into the church. And she said to me the other day, she's 96 and in a wheelchair, and she's very frail, and she said, Dwight, she said, we never talked about religion, did we? <laughs> and I said, no, we didn't need to, um, because her witness was very vibrant. And I would just say to you and to everyone, you know, great schemes and great apostolates are fine and fantastic, um, but live it right where you are, um, in your faith and in your prayers and in your works, uh, and it'll come through. And that's really what, the only thing that works. One final question, Dwight. How has becoming a Catholic drawn you closer to your Lord Jesus? Well, I think very briefly, becoming a Catholic has drawn me closer to the Lord Jesus because of two things. St. Paul said that the body of Christ was the communion, bread, and the church. And by coming into a full communion with the church and with the Eucharist and, and the real presence of Christ's body there, I have come into a much closer and intimate union uh, with Christ, more intimate than I ever could have imagined. Hmm. And discovering even in, the, in the, the humbling way of what it means to be like a person like June. In other words, to living our faith in such a way that people can believe our words yeah. by seeing us in life. That's a very humbling and growing experience. Mm -hmm. And I know that you and I have talked quite a bit that the spirituality yes. of this wonderful church is such a deep and deepening expands, drawing us to understand Jesus in a much more intimate way than we did before, but we thank the Lord for our, our past that brought us to Christ. Dwight, thank you wonderfully again for joining us on the journey home across the pond. That's right. Thank you, and we, we send a greeting to all your friends back in England, family back in England, and I also, those of you who we know now that those in England can actually see this show live. It's a fairly new happening. It's a wonderful a blessing that the Lord has given for this network. So thank you for joining us, and we also give you our prayers for your work with the St. Barnabas Society. We also want to remind the audience, if you're interested in Dwight's book, The Path to Rome, again, you can get that through the Coming Home Network here in the United States. Uh, it's through Gracewing in England, right? 
but thank you again for joining us on the journey home. Thank you for your questions and for your prayers. Uh, we walk this path together, side by side, as we seek by the grace of the Holy Spirit to follow Jesus faithfully. May he lead you and guide you. God bless you.